Emerging infections are infectious diseases that are new or spreading faster into new places. The Spanish flu of 1918 was a novel emerging infection that killed tens of millions of people. And the idea I want to share with you today is about the evolution of viruses and the way in which viruses adapt to humans plays an important role in emerging infections. If you read the newspapers, you think we're all about to die from emerging infections. This particularly beautiful one comes from Metro, a free newspaper in London. But newspapers you have to pay for all, are also in on the act. One that's coming up in a minute uh, tell, is from The Independent. You have to pay for that. It tells the sad story of this parrot that died whilst in government quarantine. It gave great joy to British people to have a whole week of newspapers about dead parrots, but also serves to remind us that pandemic influenza is an ongoing and real threat. <coughs> Nevertheless, if you live in a wealthy country, you're actually very unlikely at the moment to die of an infectious disease. These pictures here show UK adult male mortality through the last century, and the brown line is death to infection, and you see it dropping away effectively to zero with the introduction of antibiotics in the mid-1940s. However, elsewhere in the world, about a quarter of people do still die because of infectious diseases. And a large part of that threat is caused by these so-called emerging infections. This map serves to remind us two things about emerging infections. The first is that they can arise in wealthy countries as well as in poor countries. And the second that it's harder for you to see is that actually the vast majority of the novel emerging infections are caused by viruses. So I have to remind you what viruses are. They cannot make their own protein. <coughs> and they cannot copy their own genetic material, so they have to get inside a host cell and get the host cell to do it. And for some viruses, particularly the RNA viruses, the, processes, the process of copying the genetic material is highly error-prone. So many viruses are shapeshifters. Here's Bottom the Weaver from Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream with a different head. He's got an ass's head stuck on him, and he can't be recognised anymore. And many viruses adopt that as a life history strategy. They do it on purpose. HIV and influenza are two of the absolute masters of this kind of change. So what we have is a universe of viruses out there, some of them changing all the time. And that raises a whole load of interesting questions that fall into three groups. What's out there? Of all the things that are out there, which one should we be really worried about? And if they cause problems for us, could we control them? And of all those questions, the one I pick is this one. How do viruses adapt to become efficient pathogens of humans? That's a multi-step process, and the first step, which is to get from animals into humans, is not that unusual. Um, if you take blood samples from zookeepers who look after primates, many of them are infected with something called simian foamy virus. It never makes them ill, they never pass it on to anybody, but it's an ongoing lifelong infection. Even lethal new viruses that kill people and pass from one person to another do not necessarily cause big problems. This tells the story of a single woman who fell ill in Lusaka, was airlifted to South Africa, where she died the next day, but not before she'd infected three further healthcare workers who themselves went on to die and even caused a tertiary case. But in that outbreak, there were five cases, but only four transmissions and no epidemic. On average, each case caused less than one further case, so the outbreak trickled away to nothing. And that is the Achilles heel of these emerging infections. So I've given you some examples, simian foamy virus, H5N1 flu, that new hemorrhagic fever, that all made the first steps but did not make that final step to become an efficient pathogen where each case causes more than one further case. And that's the focus of some of the work that we do in the institute that I run in the James Martin School. The sort of thing we do is we say, well, what would we expect to see? Suppose you had a process where some pathogen was getting out of animals into humans all the time but was only capable of becoming a real problem and spreading widely after a long chain of rather unlikely events, unlikely transmissions from one person to another, unlikely mutations within infected people. What kind of pattern would we expect to see? We can code that up as stochastic models. Here are some runs from them. The red ones are epidemics. The blue ones are self-limiting outbreaks. The kind of thing we can do with this is look for differences that would help us know when are we here and when are we here. So overall, the idea I want you to leave you with is that it would be really useful if we had a better understanding of the way that viruses go about adapting to humans. And if we could do that, we could look out at that universe of viruses and do much, much better risk analyses. And we could also do our preparations for emerging infectious pandemics 
in a timely way.